I'm Sophie and I'm a Merchant Success Manager on Self Drive in Chilify Plus. I'm feeling really good. So uh, what's your typical morning commute like? Um, typically around 20 to 30 seconds. Right here. Oh, this is your desk. Love yeah. what you did with a pin board. Thank you. Um, so what's the best thing about working remotely? Look, turn around and just take it. Um, and what's your favourite room in the house? Ah, I'll show you. It's actually the bathroom. But oh. the bathroom is actually just a <laughs> hole in the kitchen. Um, and then what's one tip that you can give others who uh, work remotely? Um, always remember to wear pants when on a call. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to all my Shopify partners and developers. My name is Neha Revankar and I'm an integrated marketer focusing on partner marketing and I'm based out of India. It's pretty early in India right now, but I'm so excited to be your host this month for Shopify Partner Town Hall. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Shopify Partner Town Hall is an extension of a long-standing tradition at Shopify we call as Town Hall. At the town hall, we gather to listen, reflect, and get aligned on what's happening at Shopify. So for the next hour, we are going to hear from various people from across Shopify, as well as a few partners. First up, we will hear from our chief operations officer, Harley Frankelstein, who will be speaking to the current state of partner ecosystem with the help of two Shopify partners, Micah Hunter, who is the head of strategy and performance at Pocket Square, and Tommy Yong, who is the founder and CEO of Stamp.io. But don't forget, we also invite you to join the conversation during and after the town hall. Share your insights, give us a sneak peek into how you're viewing the town hall, and ask questions to your fellow partners on social media. Just be sure that you use the hashtag Shopify Partner Town Hall. Also find us on Partner Community Slack group. All right, so let's not delay this any further. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Shopify CEO, Ali Finkelstein. Hey friends, each year at our annual partner conference, Unite, I get an opportunity to stand up on stage and talk about the incredible impact that our developers and our partner communities have made. This year, well, this year has been a bit different. As the global pandemic hit the world, the pandemic has had a major impact on all of our merchants. Everyone has gone through moments of real challenge, but there's also been great examples of strength and resiliency. During this time, we watched as our merchants pivoted their businesses to not only survive, but also to thrive. And we saw the same from all of you, our partners. We have watched as agency partners and app de developers alike started hosting online classes to help educate their local merchants and get them online as fast as possible. We saw you offering your services for free in some cases to local farmers, restaurants, and coffee shops. And we saw you build out and launch new apps within days. This happened because you see the importance and the value of independent businesses. This happened because you recognize and you believe that the future of commerce needs to have more voices and more diverse voices, not fewer. From 2016 to 2019, businesses built on Shopify supported $319 billion in global economic activity. To put that into context, that's on par with national GDPs of some countries around the world. We've always said that Shopify is only successful when our merchants are successful. And what makes merchants more likely to be successful is all of you. The developers, the partners, building apps, themes, and so much more. You are the force multipliers for entrepreneurship. Our philosophy is this, build a community of merchants and partners in which we create more value for you than we capture for ourselves. Well, in 2019, our revenue at Shopify was about $1.5 billion, while our partner ecosystem generated more than $6.9 billion. In 2019, we saw more than 2 million full-time jobs supported by businesses on Shopify all over the world. And what's more, 218 million people have purchased something from a store built on Shopify. That means 218 million people have voted with their wallets to support entrepreneurs and local businesses. This matters because it empowers unique individuals behind these brands, from business owners to their families, to their communities and beyond. The exciting part is that we're just still getting started. 
In 2019, there were over 14,700 partners and businesses engaged in international activity and over 7,500 operating in developing countries around the world. This is an incredible accomplishment, but this still leaves room for so much more. The success of millions of independent businesses and their owners is critical to our world's economic prosperity. Every new business adds more value to the world, and every new business you build, every new merchant you help get online, every new app or theme you create, it helps to make an impact and make the world a better place. There is still so much opportunity up for grabs, and I'm so excited to have you alongside us helping our merchants around the world. I've always been proud of the strong partner ecosystem that we've built. But watching everyone band together to make commerce better for everyone over the last couple of months, well, this has made me incredibly proud. And for that, I thank you. I mentioned that our philosophy is to create more value for you than we capture for ourselves. That is really important, and it's a major reason why the Shopify community is so strong. But there is something more. The work we do together is for merchants. It's to make sure that people striving for independence have a fair shot at being successful, regardless of their situation. We're on this mission together to make commerce better for everyone. And we cannot slow down now. Independent businesses need us now more than ever. As I said last year on stage at Unite, together we are the largest and strongest community of people supporting entrepreneurs. And together, we are the guardians of the world's entrepreneurs. Thank you. It is my great pleasure and privilege to be here today with Micah, who is head of strategy and performance at Pocket Square. And uh, before I jump in, one of the reasons that I was uh, so excited to talk to Micah is that her experience with Shopify is sort of on both sides of, of, of the coin, meaning she started it as a merchant um, and uh, she was working at, at Mushi and Hallenstein Brothers and only then made the switch over to the agency side um, of Shopify and became a Shopify partner uh, with Pocket Square. And so, Micah, thank you so much for, for joining us today. No, thank you for having me. It's lovely to chat to you. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious uh, to understand a little bit about your experience first as a merchant, and then also um, how that has sort of shaped the way that you you work as a partner. I mean, obviously, you bring great empathy to being a partner because you understand what a merchant goes through, but I'd love to hear a bit about that today. Yeah, no, absolutely. So moving to Shopify where the mantra is really about usability and empowering businesses to be able to tackle as much with the internal resource they have as possible. First thing was like, if I had had Shopify when I was an in-house e-commerce manager, my life would have been so much easier and nicer. You know, I had certainly been one of those merchants in the past who had had these giant Magento retainers with an agency and spent 30 of our 40 hours a month um, just on bug fixing or security patches. And as a merchant, you don't necessarily have the technical background to understand where that time is going or why it's necessary, the intricacies of the platform are really kind of outside of your everyday scope. So I think one of the biggest things that I have learned is so important on the agency or partner side um, is the transparency around the communication and the transparency around the type of work that you want to be um, achieving with that merchant. And I know transparency is everyone should just kind of um, be thinking about that as a business value anyway. But I think with Shopify, it's particularly important because so much um, of the platform, like I said, is about empowerment. So there is that education piece on, cool, these are the things that you can tackle in-house. And we want you to be able to do that. We don't want to be uh, using up time um, that your team could actually be learning or taking on projects from us. We only really want the work that we can add a lot of value. We don't want to right. just be kind of time. I'm yeah, um, yeah. And I actually think that's it, it totally. In, in fact, one of the things that I, I, I speak to a lot of partners about is that in many cases, what their objective is, is really to teach the merchants how to fish, not give them the fish itself. It sort of exactly, creates yeah. a sense of independence where the merchant uh, can do a lot of the stuff on, on, on their own. And I think that is a really important thing. I also <clears> think one of the things that makes you such a great partner, I, 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 I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, 
Um, but Pocket Square was actually the first Shopify Plus partner in New Zealand. And I think yeah, the reason correct. that, uh, which is amazing, and I think the reason that you all have been so successful is because so many of you come from the merchant side first. And can you talk mm -hmm. a bit about the, the the empathy? I mean, what was it like for you, or what is it like for you when you're talking to a merchant who really is just getting set up for the very first time? Um, how has your experience as a merchant helped to understand what they're going through? I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head that empathy is really the core of that relationship. So I was definitely surprised when I moved on to the agency or partner side for the first time. Um, for the first time, moving to that partner side initially and understanding that actually not all agencies and not all um, kind of technical development teams get the best context of what the merchant is going through. So I think it's been really good working at Pocket Square um, because w one, they kind of hired me to fill that role and be able to give more insight into that merchant side and that day-to-day -day implementation of what's needed there. So even to work for an agency where from the get-go, it's part of the hiring process to focus on that need and that empathy. And also making sure that those technical teams and software developers and web developers actually have the best chance to understand the context of what um, what the platform is needed for, not just from a customer UI and UX perspective, but actually from a user management perspective. So that's a big part of how we try and build is actually, yes, we need to think about removing as much complexity from the customer, the end customer as we possibly can, but also we need to remove as much complexity from our customer, which is the merchant, and yeah. make sure that they actually can um, use their day-to-day -day resources as best as possible. Because I think the biggest thing I remember from being, oh, this is gonna get painful very quickly, isn't it? I think the biggest thing that kind of sits in my memory from being on the merchant side is how time poor you are. It's honest, it, especially in businesses that are in kind of like a high growth period and you have teams that you're trying to grow as quickly as possible, but really it's often jack of all trades kind of roles and you're in mm -hmm. the studio for two days at a time, also trying to send out your email marketing and really it's, I think it's understanding on the partner side that there's not always going to be proactivity around the website project side of things. So one of the things that uh, I've been talking a lot about lately is that it feels like the year 2030 has been pulled into the year 2020 when it comes to retail. Um, we went from like 5% of total retail sales as a percentage of 5% of e-commerce total percentage of retail sales to 15% in like eight years. Mm -hmm. And the last 10 weeks, we've gone from like 15% to 25%. Now, those are North American numbers, but they do generally resemble the trend happening globally. And I'd be curious to know from you, what is the biggest change you've seen uh, in the retail landscape since COVID-19 hit from, from, from merchants? I think it's like you said, obviously, e-commerce has been pushed to the fore and people have realized that we've been having conversations about how important e-commerce is with our clients for a long time. Um, a lot of them have big bricks and mortar footprints or uh, they're digitally native and they've started to focus on having a bricks and mortar store for the first time. Um, so we're constantly kind of pushing the value of e-commerce in digital retail and digital channels. But I think the biggest thing that we've noticed with COVID-19 is A, that conversation has been accelerated massively. Like the speed at which people are uh, needing these projects up and running is just like astronomical compared to uh, some of the deadlines that we would kind of look at previously. But I think the major thing for our merchants has been the uncertainty. Some of them have been affected more than others. We're certainly seeing some that are still getting good results and still have this amazing base of customers who are really committed to them. And even though they're shopping more online, they did shop in store before, it's just a shift of where they're shopping. Right. Um, so we are seeing positive change, we're seeing negative change, but across the board, the consistency is just that the ability to plan long term has just been pulled right under from people. So, yeah. resiliency matters here, right? It feels like a little bit that those that are more successful, sort of, you have merchants that are re resilient and you have merchants that are resistant. And the ones yeah. that are fundamentally resilient are the ones that are, are doing best. They are able to pivot based on new information. And actually, new information now is happening on almost a, an hourly or a daily cycle. And so, the ability to change your your vision, your strategy quickly is so important. So it's cool that yeah. you you say that. And I, I, I sort of, you know, moving beyond merchants, but really for you as a partner in this great successful agency, mm -hmm. what has been the biggest learning for you um, a, as a partner, as a supporter of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and small business and, and retail over this time? 
I think for us, it's the, it's the realization that the types of businesses that we were servicing before COVID is not the only type of business that is out there that needs an e-commerce structure or needs consultancy around the e-commerce like atmosphere. Like we work with kind of health and lifestyle and beauty and fashion brands. And I think especially fashion and apparel has always had quite a strong presence in e-commerce, but now we're seeing the health lifestyle and really a lot of B2B as well has come through. And they're just not people that we were having consistent conversations with previously. But I think it's realizing that the types of customer that buy from these people and especially with B2B, there are still really strong principles that are consistent across all those things. So actually we are fully capable of consulting at a really high level to all these types of diverse businesses. Yeah. Um, so I think that's been a really important learning for us that actually there are really valuable conversations to be had, even in industry verticals that we hadn't necessarily considered. So that's yeah, been, yeah. In we're, seeing too, we're, we're seeing, you know, um, verticals for us, um, things like grocery, for example, or food yeah. and beverage, it was, they were really yeah. not core verticals for Shopify. Now we're seeing lots of stores come up. And so I think, you know, we talked about resiliency on the entrepreneur or on the merchant side of things, your own resiliency inside of your agency and inside of your, your own company that you can actually bring on new types of customers, new types of clients, um, I think is really fantastic. You know, I always like to kind of end on something uh, inspirational because there's a lot happening in the world right now that is not inspirational. We're sort of going through um, a, a lot right now as, as, as a, you know, as a human race and, yeah. and, um, it's, it's a tough time for a lot of us, but what is something right now that you would say uh, has really inspired you or something that, that's really bringing you joy um, right now, given all this um, uncertainty in the world? Um, I'm actually going to go completely off the digital realm for this and be honest. Um, obviously, with everything that's happening, especially uh, on social media, like you said, there's a lot of like angst and hurt in the world at the moment. Yeah. And with the COVID epid- um, pandemic, there's a lot of disruption in human connection and being able to see friends and family. Uh, So I'm really grateful for the ability to actually log off from digital. And in New Zealand, we're very very lucky that uh, we have kind of an amazing environment around us that we can kind of retreat to and um, go back to nature and get involved in something that's just purely meditative almost. Uh, So for me, that's always where my inspiration lies is actually being able to check out from that and make sure that I am actually having some alone time and logging off from digital for a while. And I find that actually, although you need to be involved with digital to see the trends and understand how uh, customers are feeling and how merchants are feeling, it's good to make sure you have the time to reflect without the constant barrage of communication. So that's bringing me the most inspiration currently. I love that. That's, that's, uh, that's a wonderful answer. I think so many of us right now, particularly those that of us that are working from home, it is tough to disconnect. And I think um, we all need to sort of recharge a little bit, particularly those of us like myself who's an extrovert. I need to find ways to kind of add energy um, and and certainly um, doing something that is sort of outside of my desk, uh, my sort of my, my digital uh, arena right here is always really great. Well, um, I, I want to close up there. I want to say thank you to you, um, Micah, and to uh, Pocket Square. Um, I know you, you're you know, 10 of you right now, I believe, uh, based in yeah, Auckland. Yeah, yes, and, and uh, you've added two new people, so that's very exciting. Oh, uh, that, that, that's amazing. And we, we, we're so grateful that you've uh, been a great, loyal, incredible partner for us. And, and we love watching all of you grow um, alongside Shopify. So thank you so much for your trust and, uh, and for believing in, in, in working with Shopify. Um, it means a great deal to us. Great. No, thank you for having me. It was lovely to get to chat a bit more openly about what's going on and share some thoughts. Great. Well, thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. All right. We are back. Um, and this time we're back with Tommy, who is the CEO and founder of stamp.io. And, uh, for those of you that don't know stamped, uh, I think they have something like 30,000 uh, Shopify merchants using stamps and really they use it um, for product reviews, but but also to build trust with things like user generated content and increasing social proof and also generally just driving increased conversions to their online stores. And uh, Tommy, thank you so much for joining us. This is uh, it's a great honor to connect with you. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Hali. Um, my name is Tommy. So I'm from Singapore. Um, and I think you pretty much knew uh, what we do here in STEM. Um, so we basically help businesses to collect reviews uh, mm-hmm. and user generated content to increase uh, social proof and sales. 
And one of the things that I've noticed is, I mean, of your 30,000 more and, and more than 30,000 merchants that you stamped, you have obviously a lot of small merchants, but you also have SodaStream and you have HBO and some really, really big brands. And, and um, as I was doing some research uh, for this interview, I also noticed that um, you are a team of eight people, um, but the majority of uh, the folks on your team are, are in support. And uh, before I jump in, I want to talk a bit about your plans, because I know that you're going from about eight people right now to 15 people uh, next year. Um, you're at like over $10 million in revenue. You're going 70% year over year. This is really incredible. And, and the thing that I, I think is most incredible is all this growth, both in headcount, but also in actual merchant usage and downloads and revenue. Um, it's coming from a place of where, where you you are fully bootstrapped. And I'd like to start there. I'd like to start with with how you think about scale and growth um, and how you do that while still being bootstrapped. Um, that's an interesting one because uh, when we got started and when we were growing and scaling a business, um, there were a number of challenges. Um, but that two that really stood out for us is um, basically prioritizing our time um, and tasks that we should be doing first. So it's a challenge because uh, running a business, there's so many things that you need to do um, and so many things that uh, require attention every time. Uh, it's just so hard to juggle between tasks. So what I've learned uh, is to prioritize the tasks um, based on what I think will bring the most value um, to our users and to the businesses uh, using STEM. Um, and also communicating this as well to the team. So everyone is on the same page uh, about where the company is heading to and what we should be focusing on first. Um, and I, I guess- it, it, it sounds like ruthless because, prioritization has played a big role in your success. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we focus our, a lot of our effort uh, on support because we think that um, that encourages um, and build a trust uh, in our users that uh, we are here for them uh, whenever they need us. Um, but that comes the second challenge um, because when we first started, um, there was actually a time zone differences mm -hmm. uh, because most of our users are actually in the North America region. Mm -hmm. So the challenge uh, was that um, there's a 12 hours difference between Asia and North America. Um, so when it's a daytime in the US, it's nighttime in Singapore. Right. So in the early days, uh, we had to work quite late nights um, to ensure that our customer support is always timely. Um, and we don't compromise on that. Um, now, I, 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 I love it, that because it's, what you're suggesting is one of the keys to your success besides the ruthless prioritization is that it's not only enough to build a piece of technology, um, an app, um, a piece of functionality to help merchants increase their sales, increase conversion, help with, you know, reviews and, and, and user generated content. But the other side of it is that you also prioritize a major part of your, um, of your team to focus on support. And, uh, I, I love that. I mean, it just, I, I think that's, you know, that that's gotta be one of the major keys to your success. Yeah, I totally agree. That's great. So now we have a team of support, uh, customer support that is based all around the world. Awesome. And this ensures that um, our users will always get the time to support that they need, uh, regardless of the times when they are in. I love that. That's beautiful. That's really cool to hear that. Um, I also want to talk a bit about, obviously, uh, COVID-19 hit and the world changed. The year 2030 was pulled into the year 2020. And it's, um, it's been dramatic. And you know, it sort of feels like there have been retailers and merchants that have been resilient. And there's been others in the industry that have been resistant. And the resilient ones have done really, really well. And I'm curious from your perspective, what has really been the biggest change that you've seen to retail since COVID-19 hit? Um, and, and how do you think that's going to affect the future of, of, of commerce and retail? Um, I think what has changed the most uh, is probably the consumer's behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and we have seen that um, consumers prefer online purchases compared to offline. Sure. Um, and this was already happening in the pre-COVID world. Um, but now in the post-COVID world, um, some people don't really have a choice. Um, I mean, like due to the restrictions and current situation that um, forbids them to go out and buy their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I guess circumstances is uh, driving this change and will accelerate the change in consumer behavior. And uh, I guess it will affect the customers who wasn't used to online shopping and e-commerce will be kind of the new normal for them. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking that sort of and, saying, yeah. saying e-commerce is going to be like saying color TV. You don't say yeah, color TV, you, you, you just say TV because e-commerce and, and is, is sort of, you know, is ubiquitous online retail is ubiquitous, like color TVs are ubiquitous. Um, so I, I totally, I totally agree with you there. Um, one of the other things I'm, I'm curious to know about is, um, you're a partner that a lot of other partners and, and agencies look up to. Um, and obviously you are fairly, um, prolific in the Shopify partner community. Um, but if you were, uh, what's been one of the biggest learnings for you, um, during your time as a Shopify partner? Um, and, uh, and, and I guess, you know, what would be that advice that you would give to someone who's setting up for the first time as a Shopify partner today, whether they're uh, going to be referring and building Shopify stores or they're going to be building an app or building a theme? What would be some of the advice you would give them as a successful um, Shopify partner? Um, okay, that's an interesting one um, because um, I've been a Shopify partner since day one um, and that was, I think, 2016. Mm -hmm. So it has been about four years now. Um, right. If is I mean, if I have to choose one thing that sticks with me uh, until today is that I couldn't believe um, how much value and growth opportunities that was possible um, just being a partner uh, on a growing platform. Yeah. Um, and being a Shopify partner um, has been quite a life-changing experience for me. Uh, I mean, like you have shared, um, we are now a successful business. Um, with revenue in the eight figures and we honestly couldn't have done it without Shopify. Oh, that um, means a lot to us. So, uh, so I guess um, my advice to uh, agency or partners that are just starting out uh, would be that um, if you are still deciding um, whether it's worth it to invest your time on Shopify, I would definitely say go for it. Um, your Shopify is a growing platform. There's a lot of opportunities. Um, and what's really amazing about Shopify is the community and the people um, that are extremely helpful. Um, so you can always seek help and you definitely won't be alone as you go through uh, your entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. And that really makes a huge difference. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think that is really important for us is um, to not just make it easy and lucrative and exciting for partners to build on top of Shopify, but also to cultivate a community that everyone feels a part of. Um, we're all living, you know, I'm, I'm in Canada, you're in Singapore, we have part partners in more than 100 countries and merchants in more than 175 countries. It's important that we do, even though we're not uh, in the same room, that we do feel like we are together. And I think that um, the community is one of the most exciting um, and also the most inspiring parts of, 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 of um, of Shopify for me. Um, and I'm really grateful to you and so many others that you've committed your time and your energy and your money and, and your, your life to helping make Shopify better for merchants. And you certainly have done that. Um, before I let you go, there's one question that I've been asking, uh, a lot of folks that I've been interviewing, cause I'm, I'm just, I think it's important right now to not to lose sight of things that inspire us. And so what is something right now that is inspiring you? Something that is bringing you joy. Um, I guess um, every now and then uh, when we get feedback from our users um, mm -hmm. telling us that their business is growing uh, because of STEM, um, I guess that is what really makes uh -huh. the biggest impact uh, as I strongly yeah. believe that uh, our business can only be successful uh, if we genuinely help the merchants to succeed. Totally. Yeah. And, and you making others successful, uh, I can see how that's incredibly inspiring. It sort of feels like uh, in many ways, you are all um, your entrepreneur catalysts and you're helping them become more successful. And I think that that's, that's amazing. Um, that inspires me too. And, and actually having these conversations with people on other sides of the world, like in uh, Singapore, um, I, I know, uh, I, I know it's quite late for you right now. Um, and I'm grateful that you joined us today. Um, but honestly, Tommy, congrats on stamp.io congrats on all your success. Um, and, um, it is truly, um, we are truly grateful and honored that, uh, you've decided to build your business on top of Shopify and, and we will do everything we can to make sure we don't let you down. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you very much, Ali, Micah, and Tommy. 
up next we'll be hearing from fatima yusuf who is the strategic uh, partnerships lead who's going to be giving us a rundown of what's new at shopify for partners and developers followed by a special ask me anything segment with our shopify talent acquisition team on hiring and finding a diverse pool of talent Hey everyone, my name is Fatima and I lead our technology and app partnership teams here at Shopify. What's new at Shopify is a regular segment of Partner Town Hall to provide you with updated information that you need to know to continue being a successful Shopify partner and developer. Last month was a very special edition where we had JML himself talk about a ton of new products we're, we're launching, including annual app billing, which I'm personally very excited about, and the theme inspector for Chrome Collaborator account access. This month, we've got some exciting updates, so let's get right into it. The first thing I want to talk about is how we're making partners more visible to merchants. And before I do that, I want to I want to take a minute to just say thank you. It's been so inspiring to see how so many of you have stepped up to help merchants in these difficult times. And I know myself and so many others have been blown away by the creativity that you've shown in solving problems and helping merchants survive in the future of retail. We actually want to double down here. We want to make sure your apps and services are getting discovered by the merchants that need them the most. As we attract more businesses that are moving online quickly, you'll see more tailored onboarding experiences that meet vertical specific needs. And that includes highlighting apps and services that you all provide to help them along the journey. We started with building resources to get restaurants online quickly. Our new theme, Express, is designed specifically for these businesses. And as you can see, there's a section for apps, a call out to hire Shopify experts, and more information about how Shopify's platform is tailored for this vertical to help restaurants understand how Shopify can work for them. We'll be continuing to invest more in surfacing ways for new merchants to discover and connect with our partner and developer community, as well as tools and resources to arm you all in supporting them. So stay tuned and get ready because we're just getting started. The next thing I want to talk to you about is API versioning. And I know you've already heard a lot about this, but it's super important and I want to make sure you have all the information. Earlier this year, we postponed our first version removal of API version April 2019 to give developers struggling with the impact of COVID-19 more time to update their apps. This also meant that we'd be removing all support for page-based pagination in favor of cursor-based pagination on the same date, as opposed to splitting the breaking changes into two version removals. On July 2nd, support for both the April 2019 and July 2019 versions will be removed for custom, unpublished, and public apps, making the oldest supported version of our API from October 2019. It's important to know this deprecation doesn't actually impact private apps. So I know a large number of the community has already updated their apps to account for breaking changes, so I want to say a big thank you for that massive effort. Um, for those who are still working on it, we're, we are here to help. Reach out through our API forums or through partner support and use the API health report in the app section of your partner dashboard to find out if your app is still making unsupported calls. This is really important because after July 2nd, for any apps that continue to make calls to unsupported APIs, they might be delisted from the app store or blocked from new merchant installs. So it's super important to get your apps updated and please, again, reach out if you need any support in doing that. The next thing I want to talk about is something that I know that I've gotten a lot of feedback on, and that is concerns over fake app store reviews. I really want you all to know that we are paying attention and taking action on this. We take the merchant experience of the Shopify app store very seriously. Our governance teams have been doubling down on finding and removing suspicious reviews from the app store, and they've actually already removed thousands of reviews to date. Apps and partners that have engaged in false or incentivized reviews are also removed from our promotion and recommendation engines. And in some cases, they're even entirely permanently removed from the ecosystem. And this is just the start. We're investing more in systematic ways to detect and remove bad actors from the ecosystem early on. The best way to get quality reviews on the App Store is and has always been to build an awesome high quality solution and support for merchants. Developers that take the time to grow their app in the right way are always noted by our teams and rewarded with more opportunities to grow alongside Shopify. Whether that's through a closer relationship, greater insight and access, or more opportunities to get in front of merchants. And we're even taking this one step further because we're investing in alternative methods to build trust that merchants can see under the hood. 
So again, we're taking this very seriously. We've doubled down on finding and removing bad, ad- bad actors from the ecosystem. And this is just the beginning. You'll be seeing more and more systematic ways that we're going to be catching and acting on this behavior early on. Okay, now let's talk about performance. Hopefully you all tuned in to Reunite and our last couple of town halls where JML talked a ton about performance. And I've got some updates. We announced in May that we've rebuilt the engine that takes the merchant storefront liquid theme and generates the output HTML to send back to a buyer's browser. These updates are rolling out to merchants now. As of today, 5,700 shops are currently rendering and that reflects 37% of all storefront traffic. Merchants are already seeing improvements. Culture Kings, for example, are tracking their average server response time and have noticed around a 40% reduction since the changes have been made. This change also lowered their time to first byte by 500 milliseconds. It's pretty impressive. And this is just a part of improving the merchant store performance. To make themes as fast as possible, we rely on partners to optimize liquid for performance before it's rendered as well, using the theme inspector and online store performance dashboard. Which brings me to my final and most exciting update, which is our online store performance dashboard beta. So JML mentioned this earlier this summer, we're releasing a performance dashboard, which is targeted at technical users and accessible through the merchant admin. It's gonna help provide insights into how things like theme code customizations and app store installations impact the speed of a merchant store. And I can tell you as someone who was a merchant for years before joining Shopify, it's very exciting for even the non-technical users. As a Shopify partner or developer, that means that you can see how changes to liquid code or app installs are impacting your client store. This is going to help you and your clients understand the trade-offs that sometimes need to be made between speed and experiences, like when an app slows down a storefront, but it leads to increased conversion. It's also going to give you access to information like performance metrics over time, which is going to help you make more data-driven decisions around performance. By signing up, you'll get an early look and an opportunity to provide feedback. Sign up to the QR code to get access once it's available, and we'll also drop the link in the Shopify Slack partner in the Shopify Partner Slack channel right after this. So definitely sign up because we want your feedback. And there you have it, our updates for June. To get more information, make sure you subscribe to our What's New newsletter. Good night. Hi, everyone. Uh, Thanks for joining us for the Ask Me Anything portion of Town Hall today. Uh, We'll be discussing how to promote and hire for diversity. Uh, Just a quick intro on me. My name is Kelly Tedaneka, and I am the TA Recruitment Coordination Lead here at Shopify and Belonging Connector. My name is Jane. I've been at Shopify for about four and a half years, uh, always on the recruitment team. And right now I'm uh, running engineering hiring for the Americas. And hi, I'm Tammy. I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition at Shopify. Been here about four and a half years and really excited to uh, to jump into the Ask Me Anything today and to talk with you about all your questions, but especially any thoughts uh, or questions that you want to hear from us um, about diversity. So we have a few questions already. Um, I'm going to start with this question from Tess. I struggle hiring good and or qualified devs because of salary expectations and a competitive market. Do you have any tips on how to find talent when you can't afford them? Tammy, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think what's important to keep in mind is there's there's all levels of talent, all types of skill. And um, we've done a number of programs over and, and frankly experiments to, to find talent that has high potential that we can help develop quickly. Um, so I guess, Tess, if you've got a team um, already in place that you can mentor someone, um, then that can sometimes mean some lower cost talent. Um, I also think that um, bringing to life the, you know, the, the problem set that you're solving will attract people more so than how much you're paying. Um, so really getting you know, really strong about uh, the problems you wanna solve and, and how, how you wanna work with, um, with a developer to help solve those problems. Jane, do you have any further thoughts to share? 
Um, yeah, I was just going to say the um, sometimes, yeah, the problem set as well as the uh, mission. Um, so like for us, it was it's to make commerce better for for everyone. And that resonates with uh, with a lot of people. And we um, although maybe not now, like we were in the same boat at one point and we had to do some like a lot of kind of uh, convincing and really letting people know um, just what exactly the opportunities were here. And um, we ended up getting people on board that we maybe never would have been able to afford to in the past uh, just because our mission uh, resonated with them and they decided to come on board. Yes. We've also targeted um, a lot of different uh, types of talent. Um, Jane ran a, a program last year called Welcome Back, and that was attracting developers back into engineering work um, who had maybe gone astray, um, uh, pursued different career paths. Do you want to share anything more about that as a, as a pool of talent? I'm not saying it was low cost talent per se, but it was uh, a way to engage with someone they, that maybe wasn't top of their salary game at, at, at the stage they joined us. Yeah, so we ended up doing, um, we were targeting an audience that had been in the software engineering industry at some point in their life. It didn't matter if it was two years ago or, or 20 years ago. Um, and then we committed to putting them through kind of like a three month in-house boot camp per se that would help them brush up on on their tech skills and help them uh, like feel equipped to re-enter back into the tech industry. We were able to hire um, a bunch of them on full time after, which was great. And then some of them moved on to to other companies to go and work there because of the instruction and the um, yeah, the instruction that we gave them. So that was uh, it was a lot of organizing and stuff. And it took like a large team to, to get that off the ground. But there's definitely different iterations of that that you can try if you can put in the work to uh, to help them get their skills back to, to where you need them to be. Awesome. Um, so next question is from Gordon. How do you actually assess the candidates' technical skills? Do you do hiring assignments? What should a good technical interview consist of? Jane, I'm going to throw to you for that one. Yeah, I, was, I can uh, I can take that one. So how do we assess the technical skills? Um, we do a couple of different interviews. So one of them is called the technical deep dive. It's a 60 minute interview uh, with typically run by a senior developer or a development manager. And you would go through kind of one or two projects from start to finish. And we wanna know that you're able to uh, like deeply explain kind of how you solved the problems, uh, the tech stack that you used, the people that you worked with, what role you played um, in the problem or like in the solving of the problem, what role your team played, uh, just to kind of get a sense about how you talk about technical problems. Um, and then we do a couple uh, of interviews, pair programming. I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with that, but um, those are 75 minute interviews where the candidate pairs with, again, like a senior developer or a dev lead or a staff developer. And they work through a problem similar to a problem that you might run into on the job at Shopify. And the goal necessarily isn't to solve the problem, but it's to give the interviewer a sense about how you work um, how you work through a problem. So like, do you understand the problem? Are you asking clarifying questions? Um, are you mentioning like trade-offs or, or corner cases? Uh, we assess code structure. So like, is the code ne easily navigable? Um, are the complex parts documented? Like that's, that's a big, uh, like a big green flag if they are. Um, and again, how you work through like your thought process uh, so you need to be able to communicate your thoughts and um, like, so we can work with you effectively to move forward with a problem. Um, and then also like self-awareness, it's really easy to get like deeply involved in, in a problem and kind of go full steam ahead without stopping to reflect. So we wanna make sure uh, that developers are able to self-edit and, and correct their work. And what is okay. that? Oh yeah, go ahead, Kelly. I was just going to say the the other piece to that too is so there's the collaborative piece as well, um, but it's also understanding if that's what we're measuring. So while we have these pieces or these interviews that we really believe in, it's because we've looked at the data to see do these indicate a hire? Um, how often is this going to reflect whether this person is going to do well in the type of environment that we have here at Shopify? 
Yeah, great point. And I was going to add, um, we've experimented with different ways of attracting folks to apply, um, either apply with a, with a resume, but we've also done show us your code uh, as an application method. Um, so we do a code review um, as, as an application review, um, as well as, uh, uh, and Jane, I'll, I'll get the tool wrong. Is it ColorPad that we use or Kelly? Yeah. yeah. So uh, and we've only been using that for like a year. Is, yeah. is that right? So, Just over. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that helps us to understand technical skill even before we engage in a one-on-one -on -one interview. And um, all of those different factors have helped us to kind of fine tune our hiring process. And I would also add like, I don't know, we probably iterate or change our hiring process every six to 12 months. So um, we may be a bigger company now, but um, uh, we, it, we, we've, we're constantly reevaluating what works to be able to, to find and evaluate technical skill. Um, so I think that's good on that question. Uh, the next one from Anonymous is, how would you recommend that smaller companies with limited resources think about building training for new employees with less experience, for example, recent college grads? So Jane, you work with the intern program and kind of bridging that as well. If you want to take that one. Yeah, I think like, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of resources online, like Shopify now has um, kind of an internal an internal education program, but again, like that was not so like a few even like a couple like even a year ago. So um, a lot of like there's a lot of resources online um, to build out like training programs. There's obviously other um, like there's there's material that you can can draw from and then kind of make it your own. Uh, but I'm not sure. It's not clear to me if this is like kind of technical training or like new employee onboarding. So I, I don't know, some of the folks um, that are planning the partner town hall will have like clarifying questions in the Slack channel. So if you want to, um, if you want to clarify that in the partner Slack channel, we can get you an answer. Yeah. I, I might just add, um, even with our intern program where we're looking at either college or university students or grads, um, we think one of the advantages of our program is we we throw people right into real problem sets as opposed to you know weeks or months of um, of, of learning modules or or shadowing. We we want people to get hands on experience um, right away. Um, and and we've seen interns um, you know through their work through hack days through through different projects have massive impacts um, as, as new grads and early, early in, in their first few months. Um, so while we do have a formal onboarding program, both um, generally to Shopify and then specifically to our tech stack, we, we um, uh, you know, our, our real focus is setting someone up with a mentor and a buddy that, that they can work with on the day to day, you know, uh, understanding our culture, understanding the ways we work, understanding how to get their questions answered so they've got a buddy to go to, and then obviously their, their lead or their manager to help them through um, you know, learning and succeeding in their job. But we're, we're not big on you know, months and months of training, we're big on immerse yourself in the work and, and learn as you do it. So the next question, and then apologies if I'm mispronouncing this, uh, from Tara is can you think of any technical boot camps that consistently produce good quality junior candidates? Uh, I can take that one. Um, Lambda School, um, for that one's based in the US. Um, there's also Juno College of Technology, which is based out of Toronto. Um, we've hired many people from, from both of those orgs. I don't know if Tammy or Kelly, you're familiar with any other ones, but those are the two main ones that pop into my head. Yeah, and I, I think it's important for our partners to know that for engineering hiring, um, we've only just begun to build out our, our development and R&D teams in, uh, in Europe and Asia. Um, so we're not as tuned in to the programs in those regions. Um, 
yeah, I'm probably dated in in the ones that come to mind for me and very Canadian centric in the ones that come to mind for me. So, yeah, probably not the best folks to answer that question specifically. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go to the next question. Um, from RD, what is Shopify's diversity recruitment strategy? So, Tammy, mm -hmm. if you want to take that one. Yeah. Well, as all of you know, um, we have merchants all over the world. Um, and so building for merchants in, uh, I don't even know our country count anymore. Um, I think 175 and, and counting countries. Um, it's really important to us that our employee base uh, is reflective of our merchant base. Uh, we're not there yet. We have a long way to go uh, to continue to diversify our our um, our employees um, here in North America. Um, a big topic right now is anti-black racism, and um, I think it, it's uh, other other parts of the world are are very tuned into this topic right now as well. It has. Um, awakened and helped us step back again and look at our diversity strategy and understand that we're not doing enough. There's more that we can do um, to make sure that our employee base is representative of the population where we are. As you all know, we're, we're North American dominant. Um, and so in North America, populations, uh, including um, Black, Latinx, uh, in North America, Indigenous populations, these are critical uh, uh, folks that we are not currently uh, leveraging enough um, uh, to be reflective of our merchant base in North America. So there's lots of work underway to help with that um, and lots of different tactics. And, and I'll maybe hand it back to Kelly um, or Jane to, to add some perspective maybe on a few of the tactics that, that, that are allowing us to start to, um, I say start, but continue to evolve our diversity practices and strategy. Uh, sure. So I can, yeah, just from a tactical perspective, um, we find that a lot of, or like our, our application funnel, uh, rep, like is kind of consistent with a lot of uh, folks that are already uh, well represented in tech. So we do have a full um, research and sourcing team on talent acquisition that are focused uh, solely on helping us like offset our applicant funnels with more uh, diverse candidates, people that aren't applying through our careers page directly. Um, so that's like one, that's one major thing that we're doing. And from the coordination piece too, in terms of, there's the attraction piece, but there's also the in-house piece. And that's really, um, we wanna reflect that that demographic back to candidates. And so when we're creating a shortlist panel or we're deciding who will be meeting with candidates, we wanna be really intentional and who can talk about the work, but also amplify the voices of the people who work at Shopify. Um, outside of just the hiring piece, there's also just the ground level work that is available in terms of uh, creating support networks for people. So the Belonging Connector Program, which is what I'm a part of, which is really just, people who have been identified within the company who are willing to have those conversations uh, for people who might be struggling or don't know who to turn to. Um, and it's very loose and free form, um, which creates an environment where people are more open and that kind of bleeds out outside of the walls of Shopify. Yeah, yeah. you know, I think all of us talk, uh, all of us meaning companies in tech talk about gender diversity, that, that aspect of diversity has been probably the, the, the most dominant conversation over the past few years and we're no exception in that. And, and I think it's really important to think about intersectionality of, of diversity. So um, I, men, women, uh, all dimensions of diversity uh, relating to race uh, and, and inherent um, dimensions of diversity. And we know based on the country uh, where you're based and, and, and where you're operating, um, it has to hold true to, 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 to your population in your country. Um, but I also would encourage all of you because um, you know, we're, all, we're all building and, and growing towards helping the same merchant base to really understand that you know, we have a large 
and broad demographic of merchants on Shopify. And, and the more we can build with their needs in mind, uh, the better. Um, so that includes, again, all dimensions of diversity, uh, including race and gender, um, uh, age, uh, ethnicity, uh, cultural, um, many, many aspects. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one is from Darius. Oh, just jumped, sorry. Um, I'm gonna ask the one from Darius. <laughs> from posting the job to making the offer, what does your process look like to hire the best candidate? So I think this one's really interesting um, that we could talk about for a while. So I'm gonna toss to Tammy to see high level what you think. Yeah. Um, you know, Jane explained our technical interview process. Um, and, and, you know, we've worked hard to make our interview process fairly structured. Um, but we've also worked hard to make it a, a smaller number of interviews. Um, you know, when I joined four and a half years ago, it wasn't uncommon to meet new employees that had had 11 or 12 interviews. Um, I and did. <laughs> um, and that includes for developers and designers um, and product managers. And um, so we've worked very hard to get that number down to, what is it now, Jane, maybe four? Or Kelly, can you quote the average for? Averages, yeah, four. Yeah. So, um, so streamlining process is important. Um, we're up against startups that are, are doing one or two interviews and then offering same day um, uh, in many of the markets we're hiring in. And, and, and I'm sure many of you are, are nimble in your hiring timelines and practices. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but um, I would say, you know, uh, there's three sources of, of hires for us, uh, one being applicants, next being source candidates. Uh, we've, we do have in-house sourcers, our recruiter source, but our hiring managers also source and team members source. Uh, and sourcing means, you know, looking in GitHub, on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, you, multiple different tools and, and sources of, of finding great people that we want to reach out to and invite them to consider Shopify. Uh, and then the third source is referred candidates. So people that work at Shopify referring someone they've worked with in the past or, or someone they know. So from that uh, stage through to offer, um, there's interviews in the middle, conversations uh, for us in talent acquisition. Um, and I'd say our, our strongest hiring managers, um, we engage as much as possible in the human experience, um, uh, helping them understand how they'll be treated as an employee. Um, and having that same experience as a candidate is really important to us. We don't always get it perfect, but it's it's something that we hold as a, a really high and important part of our of our process. Jane, other thoughts? <clears throat> um, yeah, just from like a like again like a tactical perspective, like when we post the jobs, we put our job postings through um, like an inclusive language software for um, like just for review. It's called Textio, um, and then. After that, like we do, which is kind of our like TA's bread and butter is like the life story interview. So like that's a huge part of our process where we're looking for things like, you know, engagement in past roles, uh, evidence of having made an impact, um, self-awareness, so, like understanding how your behaviors affect others, um, things like that, it's, like which makes it. I don't know. I think that's like probably I'm biased, but I think it's like the most important interview that we do because it directly um, shapes like the the current and like the future culture of Shopify by the people that we that we bring in. Um, so yeah, job postings, then that initial that initial interview, and then what's called the shortlist. So like for example, for Eng, that was the tech deep dive and the two pair programmings that I went uh, over earlier, and then after that, it's like. You know, we will discuss salary. Reference checks are a huge part of our our process, and then hopefully making making the final offer. So that's like a really fast forwarded version of what the process looks like for Eng. But I hope that answered your question. Awesome. Um, so we're almost done, but I wanted to just throw it out there to see if anybody had any quick closing remarks or takeaways. Mm -hmm. It was really fun to do this. Um, I, we love we we love talent acquisition. We love Shopify. We love our merchants. So 
um, helping our partners to grow uh, your teams, whether whether you know you're you're a founder and and hiring your first employee, or whether you've got um, a recruiter already on staff. Um, yeah, we love helping out and and supporting you. Awesome. Well, that is it for us. Thanks everyone for submitting your questions. And back to Neha. Thank you, Fatima, for sharing this Shopify's latest updates, and to our talent team for sharing some ways to ensure your hiring practices promote a diverse and extremely inclusive workforce. Sadly, we have reached the end of our live stream. If you haven't yet, please join us in the Shopify Partner Community Slack, where thousands of Shopify partners and developers are already collaborating, sharing ideas, and connecting with each other. From all of us at Shopify, I want to thank you for joining us today. A special thanks to our speakers and, of course, to my Shopify colleagues who work really hard to bring the town hall to us every month. Wishing you all a great weekend and see you next month. Namaste.